Hi, I'm David R. Lewis. Welcome to Theater of the Mind. Today's Heartland Memory takes us back to the 1960s and is called Spock. Her name was Miss Spock. She was my first house cat. I was 22 years old and no lover of cats. My new wife was, however, a lover of cats. And she rescued a kitten and added Miss Spock to our family. I, in spite of my best efforts to the contrary, fell under her spell. In an effort to make up for lost time, I got a kitten of my own. He was named Little Leroy in homage to Bad Bad Leroy Brown. In the ensuing years, Leroy more than lived up to his name. Miss Spock was of the common mixed breed variety, black with white feet and a white snip on her nose. She was unremarkable in most ways, very remarkable in some. Her name turned out to be also a prophetic choice. During the first half of her life, she was aloof, poised and prone to fixing the nearest human with a wide-eyed, unblinking stare that would often have her victim squirming in his chair. Very Vulcan-like was Miss Spock, not open to displays of emotion, declining affection, intolerant of exhibition. Distant and discerning, she observed humans but would not engage them. Spock was above such emotional nonsense. She would let her hair down only with Leroy. The two of them loved each other totally. Miss Spock had many trials in her long life. She survived feline distemper after the vet had given up on her. She conquered cancer twice. She related to her difficulties the way she related to life, remaining coolly detached from the mundane and impervious to the emotionality around her. Such was her Vulcanness until the most difficult challenge of her life. The death of her partner and friend, Leroy. Leroy passed in Spock's 13th year, and she lay down on her side in the middle of the living room floor and voiced a low, moaning groan that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Lara and I had never heard her produce that particular sound before, and it frightened us. It continued for days, and there was nothing we could do to comfort her. When she eventually did get up, she began to prowl the house, calling Leroy, looking for her beloved friend. Her search went on for weeks, with Miss Spock losing weight and will as she wasted away to only a few pounds. When she finally gave up the hunt, she was so emotionally and physically battered, we thought that she would surely die from sorrow. Her heart and her spirit were broken, and Lara and I were helpless to do a thing about it. Then, one marvelous afternoon, she asked me to play. I was flabbergasted. For the 13 years she had been in our family, she had never played with us, never sat on our laps, never accepted more from either of us than just a casual pat, remaining true to her Vulcan namesake. And now, this paragon of logic and restraint wanted me to play with her. In the days ahead, Miss Spock transferred all the affection she lavished on Leroy to us. She became a tease, a wrestler, a lap snoozer, a cat of an emotionally different color. Her personality blossomed and humans were its sunlight. Spock cast cat decorum to the winds and became a clown. She loved everybody within reach and would engage in shameless cat play at the drop of a rubber mouse. It was an amazing and joyous transformation. Years later, near the end of her life, Spock's mind began to go. Physically, she was still quite capable, able to run and box with our other cats, her eyes only slightly cloudy, her bones only slightly brittle, but mentally. Mentally, she spent very little time in this reality. Miss Spock would forget where she was and become frightened, calling for help. During the night, Lara and I would each arise several times to find the old girl and hold her. 
calming her fears and returning her to the current time and place. When she had physical contact with either of us, she was fine, firmly grounded and secure, her tail lashing and her purr rumbling as she gave and received love. But when that contact was broken, so was her emotional grip on life, and she suffered. It was difficult for us and dreadful for her. Reluctantly, we faced the inevitable and discussed having her put down. Our heads were decisive, but our hearts were less than logical. We were unable to reach a decision that Miss Spock soon made for us. One evening, she jumped from Lara's lap, laid down on her side in the middle of the living room floor, and began to call Leroy. When Lara and I heard that moaning groan she'd voiced only after his death so many years before, we both knew it was time. Four months before her 25th, that's right, 25th birthday, Lara took her to the vet's office. As preparations were made, Miss Spock, well known among the staff, visited with everyone that came to say goodbye to her and reclined on Lara's lap. The doctor approached and began to insert the needle to sedate her. As he did, Miss Spock died. None of the narcotic entered her body. She just went on her way. In search of Leroy, I suppose. At least that's how it seems to me. I'm David R. Lewis. Thanks for dropping by Theater of the Mind.